I want to thank all of you guys for being here. Um, we can't do this work without you guys, our volunteers. Our volunteers are amazing folks. Um, you, you help us doing the yard work, the hard work, the dirty work, the painting. Um, and I appreciate you all because what you give is your time. People can give money and we appreciate that. Don't get me wrong because we need your money. But time is precious. We can't get back time. So time is very, very precious. And we want to recognize that and say thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for that for coming and showing up. And uh, we love it that we get together, we make friends. I've made another wonderful friend, a couple of friends I think are going to be lifelong friends, so I'm having a great time. And then finally, I want to thank our staff. Our staff are stellar and amazing and help keep these wheels running. And we have some of the most hands down, beautiful staff. Um, and, and that includes our executive director, John Moon, who is the best executive director of any Habitat for Humanity uh, affiliate across the nation. So uh, thank you, John, for everything. And then uh, we have something really special. Uh, we like to say that housing is a problem, and it doesn't matter um, what, what political party you affiliate with. It's a problem. And so I'm really, really excited and thankful that we have the special guests that we'll have here today. And I'm excited to hear the solutions um, and the comments that they have today. So I want to finally thank them for showing up. Many of them are working on projects with us, so thank you for that. Um, and so without further ado, because I know you're excited to not hear me talk, but to hear them talk. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic off to a wonderful Mr. John Moon. Thank you, John. Thank you, Gina. So Community Build Day started for a Habitat um, four or five years ago and um, in um, Leeside in, in, um, in Blaine, in Church uh, Bay Area. And we have two alumni. So, so one is a staff member, Paul. He'll remember that site. And he'll remember that site because um, of the amount of mud that he would have. <laughs> He would bring back, but in, in, in talking to folks this morning, I think we have we may have another alumni, and that's Hannah over here. That um, Hannah volunteered um, out in the Birch Bay area, is what she remembered, um, about four or five years ago, and then moved away from from Whatcom County, and, uh, and then came back. So the reason why we started with the Community Build Day is that when we came into the um, to this neighborhood in, in Birch Bay. There was a lot of nimbyism. Um, a lot of people did not want um, Habitat bringing in uh, a Hispanic family to that neighborhood. And so we thought that the best way to get past that was to um, invite the neighborhood to clean itself up. And because there were a, a lot of distressed properties and um, a, a lot of depreciating assets sitting in the driveways. And, and so um, it worked. It worked really, really well. The, the family across the road that spoke um, probably most disparagingly of the family that we wanted to bring in um, ended up just being the greatest name as possible. So, so Habitat knows from, from this long, long experience now is that when you bring people of different cultures, um, different socioeconomic groups together in a common purpose, that just wonderful things happen at the work site and then wonderful things happen to us as human beings is being fulfilled. And so, um, so we've continued to do this uh, community building. Um, and so here, the King neighborhood, uh, King Mountain neighborhood, we're very glad that we have, this helps us have a good relationship with the neighborhood. Um, and there were some concerns when we first came here, that we could be putting how many houses back there? You know, what's it gonna do to the traffic? What's it gonna do to the neighborhood? Um, but that's the one little thing about, I think about Habitat, is that it brings people together in common purpose. And that's kind of how we wanted to, um, to structure today's program. Um, we have all of our candidates very purposely sitting at the same table because we know that they've been out there slogging away, getting dirty, getting sweaty, and, and they have, at least for, for today, a common sense of purpose. Um, one of the things that I just mentioned to the table is that um, one of the other wonderful things about Habitat is that um, people not only volunteer their time um, they may, may be volunteer their professional service. 
so architects, engineers, or they donate the roofing, or they donate windows. And, and typically, 40% um, of uh, the cost of, of a home comes from donated products and services. Uh, we call this in kind. Uh, so conceivably, uh, we could build a house completely from, from donations. The land, the foundation, the roof, with, with, with really one exception. And um, before I go to the, the things that we've asked the candidates to respond to, um, the one thing that we've never been able to really duck is the fees that we have to pay to the government to create the housing that they say they so desperately need. And so that's, that's a takeaway <laughs> that I can give from, from having that perspective. Um, that would be wonderful. So I know from my, from my experience that here in Whatcom County, there's enough windows, there's enough doors, there's enough two by fours, there's enough everything to build every home that we could possibly build this year. We just have to be creative and purposeful in how we bring those resources to solve this crisis that we have in the county. So the, the format for the day is that um, we didn't want to get into a debate, but we did feel that, that we wanted to give the candidates a chance to talk about um, how they perceive the housing crisis and what they would do, what their priorities would be. Um, we gave them some insights as to what we would like them to respond to, um, but we're not going to necessarily hold them to it. I think the important thing is that, is that we listen and, um, and we hold on to the things that are dear to us and, and try to push them forward. So this is, this is what we gave everyone. The United Way Allison report indicates that 42% of the population in Whatcom County struggles with housing. Habitat for Humanity reports that one in seven Washington state pay more than 50% of their income on housing. And that habitat calls to being cost burdened. And when you're paying more than 50%, you're not being able to give your children, the rest of your family, the health care, the food, the education that they, they deserve. Um, so what do you see as the major contributing factors to the housing crisis? What will your policy priorities in mitigating these contributing factors be? What role do you envision a nonprofit, low or middle income housing producers? What role will your administration play in supporting housing producers? What resources will your administration provide? Um, so with that, I think that um, hopefully they will respond. Um, but again, as I said before, the thing that we really want to do is to, is to listen. So um, we have picked an order so that we can get folks out on time. Um, and there's other, other than that, there's no particular reason for, for the order that we picked. And before I ask Alicia to come up and, and respond to those questions, um, I want to thank Holly from Holly's Meat Pies for... Um, So again, this is a this is a, a wonderful story. Is that probably I think it was four or five years ago. Um, my memory is my memory is getting tough and tough of it. Um, we had a, a group of students come in, as we often do. Um, we have maybe twenty, maybe sometimes as high as forty students come from all over the country. Um, Habitat calls us college challenge, and so we had these these um, youngsters visiting us. And so when they here, we try to house them, we try to feed them. And, and Holly was one of the one, one, wonderful businesses that stepped up and fed these kids when we were here. And so we're eternally appreciative for that. Um, oh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that I hope that, um, that our partner um, with the uh, uh, Telegraph Town Home Project just across the road, uh, Dean Ferrin, who's the Executive Director of the uh, Coastal Community Land Trust, um, he was going to be here, but he had a, um, a family emergency come up. So um, hopefully everything will be resolved okay with him, but, uh, but we certainly want to acknowledge um, the value that Colson has brought to this project, and um, we appreciate that. So Alicia, if you'd like to come on up, please. So, so the format is, is just we're going to give her 10 minutes. Um, at about nine minutes, we're going to start dinging her gently, and at 10 minutes, we're going to ding her fiercely. <laughs> Thank you so much. I always feel like 10 minutes is going to be um, too much for me to talk, so you'll tell me if this is the case. <laughs> Put your hands fiercely. 
Thank you so much for having me today, and most importantly, thank you for the time you've given. Um, this dedication to housing on a beautiful day like this is no small thing. And I hope that when you go to bed tonight and you're tired <laughs> and you're sleeping well, you can really just pat yourself on the back for a moment and realize that there's a lot of things that you can do to spend your Saturday on a beautiful day like this. And you chose to do this, and it's meaningful and powerful, and it really matters to people. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the policy, but really I also want to tell you a little bit about why this matters to me. <clears throat> I have been a social worker for my whole professional life. And during that time, housing insecurity in all of its forms is something that's presented itself day after day after day, and it has only gotten worse, not better. What this looks like to me, oftentimes, but not always, is children. And this is what I know. When, when children or adults have housing insecurity, nothing else works. When you are afraid and you have anxiety about your basic needs being met, it's not just about the roof over your head. It's about the feeling that you can lay your head down at night and be safe and that you know there's home. I've heard uh, a young child who reconnected with me at, in later time, and they said, you know, when I was younger, we always said in this place or that place the house because it was never ours. But then when we finally got into a place of our own, we finally started calling it home. And that's what you all are doing. That's what you do when you come out here. You're giving people homes, security, a secure landing place at the end of the day, but also to wake up and to go do what they're meant to do in this world because they know they have a home to go to, go home to, to feel safe in. Um, so that's why this matters. It's not just a project. It's not just a line item on a budget. Uh, this is about people. And what that means for me in Olympia is that I will go fight like I have before to pull back money to make sure that when we talk about housing, we're talking about housing and addressing it in all of its forms. And this is one of the forms that's really important. And the reason it's important is one, it works really well here in our district. And it also works really well because it allows people to have a handle on a hand up so that they can begin to feel like that's taken care of. Now I can move forward and start reaching goals. This is not an unattainable thing that doesn't belong to me like it belongs to others. This is something I can do. And I, and I just want to tell you that it's not the other who's using this housing. It's people who we work with. It's our neighbors. It's people who are giving back into our community in robust ways, sometimes working in places that just don't pay a lot. Um, I was at one the other site up over there, the Colchon site, the other day, and lo and behold, it was a friend of mine who I'd worked with for years, who was in the housing, and she was a single mom with tears in her eyes, and she said, I'm so happy to see you here. This is my home. We couldn't see it. Um, she was so proud of the, the space that they had out in front, and I love the housing because it has this community set up that really allows people to connect. It's not just about putting a base at four walls, but it's thoughtful and it's homey, and it's really practical. When I toured those, that particular site, I was really excited because as a single mom myself, I thought somebody really put in the detail and the heart to make this housing work for families so that they knew the way that this, this layout would work would work really well for people. So I know that you are all connect, uh, connected and committed to this work as well. I'm thankful for your partnership. Um, I will continue working on every front, not just money, which is very important, um, I, will, I will share with you that the first year I was committed to housing, and I always will be, and we happily voted to support um, the Housing Trust Fund, which is very important, but I learned that that did not include any funding that first year for these types of projects. And it was important to me that we worked to include these types of projects the next year, so I, I personally worked to advocate for that with our budget chairs. It's something that I did with my own hands. <laughs> So I want you to know that I do care about this very much because I know that it matters to people um, and that I'm com committed to doing that work. The other thing I want to tell you about is a couple of bills that I worked on. Because of my life as a social worker, I think a lot about, and especially with kids, so I think a lot about uh, what, that, what homelessness looks like. Homelessness looks like for our kids. And sometimes it's surprising because when people think about homelessness, they think about 
a tent under a bridge, and that's a type of homelessness for sure. But there's also the type of homelessness that our kids experience where they're going from couch to couch to couch, from an uncle's house to a friend's house. I mean, those are the kids I work with a lot, personally, intensely. I, you know, when I talk about them, I have many names and faces that come to mind. And, uh, you know, I thought about them as we, were, as we were working on what we could do with legislation to help those kids specifically. So one of the bills that I prime sponsored and we were able to pass was to target that exact um, population. And that means now if we have kids who are sleeping in places like a camping trailer or um, don't have a stable residence of their own, they qualify as homeless, which seems pretty sensical, doesn't it? <laughs> Um, but that, that's a really big deal because it means that they can now qualify for other services that will help buoy them into an equitable, equitable space so that they can get into Head Start, that they can be somewhere safe while we help with other resources to help their families and keep their families together, safe, and on the road to, to recovery and um, stability. So I will continue to do this work so long as you give me the honor of allowing me to do it, and I am only here to tell you that I am with it's great gratitude that we are partnering. I see the work that you're doing. I appreciate you. There's a lot of things we get to do in this work, but when I look out and see your faces on a Saturday like this and your tired bodies, I want you to know that I, I really appreciate you. Um, keep going. It's amazing what you're doing. It matters to people and it matters to those families very much. Thank you so much for having me today. I don't know who's next, but I'm happy to pass the mic to Senator Simon. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rep. Rule. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm not dry, dressed quite as nicely as uh, Representative Rule is, as you can see. So I hope you apologize uh, <laughs> my attire here. But I enjoyed uh, pulling some weeds today and doing some landscaping with uh, with some of you. Some of you have met before. I. Uh, I met some of you at the fundraiser event at the manor uh, back, how many weeks ago was that? A month ago. A month ago, thank you, Fred. And uh, some of you I've met today for the first time, but I'm Simon Stefsik, I'm your state senator here in the 42nd legislative district. Uh, I got appointed to the state senate in January uh, after my predecessor passed away. And uh, my plan in life was not politics in this stage. Uh, I'm a bit younger probably than the average politician that you'll meet, uh, but I always did believe, uh, growing up on a farm in Ferndale, taking care of goats, horses, and chickens, that, that ordinary people can accomplish extraordinary things when they care about their community. And that's why it's been so cool to come and see uh, this organization and all of the work that you do. You know, I, I remember uh, as a kid, I'm sure many of you felt this way, uh, you know, whenever you might go on a road trip or a vacation or whatever it was, I remember, you know, sometimes uh, growing up, my family, we would do like month-long road trips in an RV, right, in a trailer. And even though it was always tons of fun, there was something, there was just something unparalleled to the experience of getting to go back home, right? There was something special about uh, opening the door and smelling, every house kind of has a smell. You know what I'm talking about? Getting to go back to your home and seeing your bedroom, even if it was messy when you got back there. And, and walking into your kitchen again because there was something special about having a place to go to, a place to sleep safely at night, at night uh, that, that was meaningful, to have a home. That's oftentimes what we, we mean when we talk about the American dream. It, it's this idea that a young person is able to go on that housing continuum and ultimately own a home. It's a dream for so many young people. It's a dream for me personally. And that's why this issue is something I'm so passionate about. I have the honor of serving on the housing committee in the Washington State Senate. Uh, but what I've said before is, you know, in some ways I feel like I'm living in a county that I can't even afford to live in, even though I represent this area. You know, the average cost of a home in Whatcom County is $650,000. In Bellingham, it's, about, it's closer to about $750,000. You know, I want to be able to live that dream. I want my kids to someday be able to rush back to their home knowing that it is a place that is safe. Uh, and, and there's something, and all, all of you talked about before, there's a value in ownership. You know, a, a value in actually uh, owning property. It's, it's not only the heart, I believe, of, of some of the uh, historic nature of our, of our country, the idea of property rights, but it also creates so much more dignity oftentimes. And 
You know, I was doing some research last night, uh, and the Habitat for Humanity in Seattle, King, and uh, in King County talked a little bit about this because they say, and I think they're correct, they said the reality of the disparity between Washington State's support for rental shelter and supportive services uh, for housing and Washington's support for homeownership is roughly 20 to 1 in favor of rentals, shelters, and supportive services. That is a massive racial and economic equity issue as well because it ensures developers build only rentals in communities of color, denying families opportunities to become homeowners and build equity. And you know, that's a, a real part of the conversation I think we also need to address, which is the fact that when the state spends so much of its resources only on sort of those rental and supportive services aspect, we ignore that part of accomplishing the American dream, which is geared towards being able to own a home someday. Because if you're able to own a home, that's the, the greatest sign of, of being able to possess equity to pass on to your kids and being able to actually develop generational wealth. And that's harder and harder when, as John correctly pointed out, uh, there's always new taxes and new fees that come out of the Washington State Legislature that seem to increase the costs and difficulties uh, and, and regulatory burdens involved in building homes. According to the BIAW, which is a building organization, about 23.8% of all housing costs in the state of Washington are from permitting and licensing fees alone and the consequences of those delays. I mean, so it's, it's one of those things, you can subsidize housing all you want, but unless you also address the regulatory burden that comes with every single new uh, tax or law that gets passed, that's going to continue to make it harder for all of us and for developers to be able to develop that equity and pass it on to their children or, or their grandchildren someday. And so that's why I think we have to think seriously, and again, I've seen this in the housing committee, uh, about our approach to housing. We, we all the time talk about affordable housing, and of course, I think everybody wants affordable housing. Uh, somebody else worded it before to me in a way that I think makes sense, which is we also need to focus on abundant housing. If we can think of abundant housing as a model, I think that brings us a lot further along in that goal. What does that look like? Well, you know, first we have to remember, 72% of Washingtonians cannot afford a median priced home as of December 2021, so in, in the state of Washington. Every additional $1,000 in the cost of a new home prices about 2,500 people out of the market. So every bill you know, that gets passed, uh, price that, that increases those fees or those costs or those regulatory burdens, it, it's not just that this goes into sort of the ether, the effect. It ends up having a direct consequence by pricing thousands of people out of their ability, their chance to live that dream and go towards home ownership. And so I think we need to uh, build up. I think we need to build out. I think we need to look at more density options in areas, especially uh, urban areas like Bellingham, where we might have more of an infrastructure to be able to do so. But I also think we need to expand uh, the amount of land we're able to build on um, and, and be able to expand out into the county as well. Uh, because the fact of the matter is that there's a large desire as well for single-family housing uh, for, for homeowners as well. And we, we can't exclude those opportunities. And, you know, the owning a home allows us to reduce rent costs. It provides more secure places for individuals and their families. And it ultimately allows more freedom in creating personal space. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of ways we can do that. I think we need to address the permitting issues that do oftentimes get caused when we have regulations like the Growth Management Act which sometimes are, are very confusing for our uh, permitters and for our cities that conflict with something like the Shoreline Management Act. And then, you know, there's no real hierarchy, and so it makes it very, very difficult oftentimes for cities to know how to zone and allow for building. And so I think there's a lot of common sense areas that we can work in a bipartisan fashion to address so that people can, can live that dream someday. Um, and I think we can expand opportunities to do that. I think we can create uh, home ownership opportunities and uh, reduce especially taxes for those that are trying to climb up that housing ladder. And there's, there's progress that's being made in this. Um, and so, you know, happy to jump into the details, I suppose, if there are any questions. But, um, you know, overall, I would say, I think a, a big emphasis needs to be to exactly what, what John talked about, that uh, we, can, we can talk all day long about expanding opportunities for housing, but when the costs just associated from essentially doing business in the state of Washington under 
uh, under the government through taxes and licensing fees, that's only going to make things more and more difficult. And so uh, that's why this is a, a huge priority. Again, I'm a, somebody who grew up in Whatcom County. I love it here. I want to be able to own a home here. I want to be able to raise kids here. I want to be able for them to raise kids here. But it seems like it's getting more and more difficult, and that has to end. Uh, and so I think that dream that all of us have uh, of being able to own a home is not only a great way for us to, to bring equality into our discussion, but it's a great way to pass on equity to our kids, our grandkids, and to make Whatcom County a more fair place for an economy that, that works for all. So uh, with that being said, I will pass it on to whoever the next person is, but uh, thank you all again so much. And uh, I don't know that I'm going to be able to, to stick around afterwards to, to clean up, but I think some, some people are. So thank you for uh, enduring my bad gardening skills as well this morning, to those of you that were with me. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I did at least change my pants and my shoes, because, oh my gosh, my toes were so full of dirt. Because I was just signing, and he talks down, but he did a good job, because I kept saying, uh, put your young back into it, because mine isn't going to hold up. So <laughs> we work very well together, and I appreciate the opportunity uh, today to come down and uh, speak with you and see how this community working together uh, is so successful in what you're doing. Um, I love communities such as this, where you're working together to build the community, and you're working with the people who are going to be a benefit of this community, because when you work with people and you see the uh, love from the community and the support from the community, it is really uh, what, what people need to really feel a part of something. And that's what this does. Um, I've always been a big believer in the hand up, not hand out model. And that's what this is. You're helping them get where they need to be. Um, I've been working as a disaster case manager with the flood survivors through the Welcome Long-Term Recovery Group. And uh, that is really a part of what I'm supposed to be doing is I'm walking alongside them. I'm not doing the work for them. I'm their encourager. When they're down, I'm helping them. Uh, sometimes, but it's more about showing them how to do it so they gain the confidence of, and knowledge that they can do it. And communities and programs such as this is why I think this is such a successful program. So I'm going to, um, a little bit about me, you might not all know me. I grew, I grew up here in Whatcom County uh, on a dairy farm south of Linden. And uh, my, my parents, Jake and Claudette Dykster, raised uh, 11 of us on that farm. Um, they needed more workers, so uh, they just <laughs> kept having us. Um, but uh, my father actually grew up in Holland and, um, and immigrated here in 53. And the primary reason for coming here was land ownership. He wanted to have a dairy farm. And in, in Holland, he would never get there because of the lack of land. And so they moved their whole family here to pursue my father's goal of owning a dairy farm. And he was able to have that goal, and it was amazing. Um, and so the goal of, for people to be able to own a home, specifically because they, it is the generational wealth, because you could pass it on to your children. And that is what you guys are doing here. But it is very difficult. Um, when I think about what I'm running for and where I'm, what can I do at the level, um, at that level, and he's, uh, John touched on it, and it's the permitting fees. When I look at the amount of money it costs to, before you even uh, put the first shovel in the ground, we need to do better. And uh, the Growth Management Act that Senator says it touched on is a huge part of that, and they've added several other, um, like the wetlands, or not the wetlands, the SEPA and other things to that Growth Management Act. So there needs to be a major overhaul of that uh, to, because it was created in the 90s. A lot has changed and we need to update that to lessen those permit fees so that people can have that dream of home ownership. I know there's been several um, uh, proposals for even more fees that could raise the cost of permitting fees even upwards of $20,000 more. And that's unaffordable and that, just speaking to the, the numbers that Senator Sussex uh, spoke about, $1,000, additional, it, it um, makes people, another 2,000 people, unable to afford that home. And so that definitely is something, I know a lot of reasons is uh, environmental protection acts, but we raise a generation that are very 
conscientious of the environment. And I think if we give people a little more freedom to do it right, and encouragement to do it right, uh, we don't need to be charging so much for that. And so uh, I am brand new on the housing uh, thing, although my dad, after farming, went into construction and contracting. So I know how to swing a hammer pretty good, and I'm pretty good with the sawzall. But um, uh, as far as that, uh, but I will be working with, in law enforcement, that's my background. I was a delegate police officer here for 25 years. And what I was very good at is finding the people um, that had the right knowledge for whatever I was investigating. I had a um, serial rapist that I was trying to track down and solve that case. I talked to detectives in LA, the FBI on the West Coast, and I even had a two-hour hour consult with the behavioral health, basically criminal minds. Um, people in Quantico when I'm trying. So I know how to find the right people who have the right answers when I don't have the right answers. And that's what I'll do uh, for you in Olympia. I go and I find the right people. But some of these right people that I would be working with are in this room. John is a wealth of knowledge of what you guys need to be successful in this program. And you, you have more knowledge than I will ever have. And I would look for you guys as leaders in this community to help me do the right things for you in Olympia. And so that is my promise uh, to you, is to work with the people that have the right tools so that we can get the job done right the first time. So um, I think you talked about administration, complicate or reduce. So I'm trying to go through uh, low cost capital. You know, Again, John, I'll be coming to you on whatever is, would work best for you guys as well. And, uh, I am uh, endorsed by Housing Affordability Council, and so uh, I have uh, people and resources in that arena that will help walk alongside me to help make sure that we get it done right. So thank you so much, and I'll stand by, or I'll be around after if you have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, would you like to come on up? Uh, I think uh, no, I have... you have got your answer for me. Cool. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Old knees. Yeah, they don't get younger. No, no, they don't. That's why. That's why I like to use the tractor because it's easier than the shovel. <laughs> Alrighty, so my uh, digital notes, if you will. Um, Dan Johnson running for. Washington State House of Representatives position two. Uh, Tosh is running for position one, so we would be side by side in the House. <clears throat> Excuse me. I would like to say, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to be out here today and to, to help with such a great program. I, I enjoy it. In fact, I'm staying here for the afternoon as well with the tractor, and we're going to sling some uh, buckets full of dirt around, so pretty excited about that. There's a couple things that are uh, that I was raised on, I guess, and that is the satisfaction of a, a job well done and having somewhere to lay your head at night. And I think that if I understand correctly, the, the concept of Habitat for Humanity is that the, the folks that are moving in also contribute to the, the building of their homes. Is that still how this works? Right. So. You can achieve both of those things through this program is the, the satisfaction of a job well done by helping with the building of, of what you're going to call your home one day. And you will have seen it grown just like when you are raising a family and you can watch your children grow in your, in your family. As it grows, so does your home. And it, it's just it's a, a neat thing to, to be a part of. And I say that because... I've, I've only lived in one house, and I was fortunate that in 2003 we were able to build. And the only house I've ever lived in is one that I helped build as well. Um, my friend was a general contractor, and so I would come out after work and help him, but I got to see it every step of the way. And it's tremendous when you're walking around and you can, you can think of the, the bones of your house and know where like every pipe and outlets and all that stuff that's in there. It's, it's pretty interesting to me to see. Um, everybody should have somewhere to rest their head at night. They should have a place to call home. 
And I think that I'm preaching to the choir here. I think we can all uh, agree with that. What are some of the issues that we're, we're dealing with with the, the, the building right now? And yeah, it's something that's been touched on. It's affordability, availability, inflation, permitting fees, regulation, land use, all of those things that come into play. And as was mentioned before, uh, the Growth Management Act, which has 13 main principles in it. And as uh, Tasha had mentioned a few minutes ago, it was built in or created in 1990. And it's time to have that re-looked at, reassess, and reevaluated, and see as we evolved in the last what, 32 years, how we can also make that more applicable to what we're looking at today as the ground we have to work with in the environments we have to work with. And so to talk about what we can do to help fix, yeah, looking at the GMA, uh, affordability and availability is something at the state level that we can do is work with the bringing the money back into the district to help with infrastructure in some of the areas that are trying to expand and as people are moving out of Bellingham and want to get into more of your remote areas like, you know, Blaine, Ferndale, Everson, Nooksack, Sumas, and some of those areas, and in eastern Whatcom County, right, in Maple Falls and Kendall areas, I've met with some of the small town mayors, and the thing we keep talking about is the infrastructure dollars. The, the people are coming, and maybe the land is there and it's usable, but it's water, sewer, power, broadband, internet, your basics that you need when you put in a, a community and a development, but then also it's what resources do they have around there as far as, um, is there a grocery store? Is there uh, a refuse, maybe a transfer station or something like that? So we were out in the Maple Falls area last week, I think it was, and that was something that I think would be huge for that community out there is to have in a, a, a spot where they can take their trash, right? Instead of running all the way to the west end of the county out in Ferndale. And then RDS can figure out a way to get it from point A to point B. But it seems like that, it's the infrastructure when you're, when you're building a community. Everybody here today is building a community with, you know, four walls, a roof, and a floor. And then from the state level, we're gonna look at what we can do to help get the rest of that in place so the, the home is the last thing maybe we have to do, that all the services and everything is, is all lined up. Uh, let's see. Access to low cost capital. <clears throat> everything that I've been led to believe with Habitat for Humanity is it's a, a joint venture between the homeowner and Habitat and to where everybody's putting a little bit into it. And when you talk about access to capital, the, the financial part of my brain from being in business for so long kind of kicks off. And that's something to where the homeowners themselves, right? It's whether you can get a good interest rate on capital or, you know, what are your spending habits? What does your credit score look like? And all of those things that help when somebody wants to loan you money and then you can get money you know, from a loan to get the best interest on that loan and to get that capital to make it work the best for you. Also, you as the person that's wanting that, uh, that low cost capital have to do your part in you know, maintaining current on all your bills and credit cards and you know, uh, the, the available credit, all the nuances that come with having a good credit score and those things which will help people look at you as a better risk when they do want to loan you the money. So I don't want to turn this into like a financial seminar or anything, just that's one of the things I look at. And you know, it's budgeting. Overall, it's just making sure you know how much money you have in the bank, how much is going out each month, how much is coming in each month, and then using it to the, the, the best you can and, and stretch those pennies sometimes and uh, making those ends meet. And, you know, I guess overall it's uh, what do folks do with the money that they do have and something that if, if, you're, if you're in a position where you're not super high in earning, then it's a matter of budgeting and, and all of the things that I just mentioned. So I, I'm trying to be redundant and stay on that. At the end of the day, 
we need to look at reducing the building costs. But then bigger picture, we also need to look at reducing material costs, building costs, permit fees, grounds, the infrastructure, the property taxes, all of the things that come into home ownership. And am I at nine minutes? Oh, sorry, sorry you got up. I didn't want to get poked with a stick. Okay. Uh, yeah, and so property taxes is another thing that in government we'd be able to uh, probably work on and look at is I think that uh, when I was in CMAS, somebody was just telling me that their property taxes a couple weeks ago, they just got their new assessment. It went up over 30%. CMAS was under water 12 months ago. How in the heck can you, as an assessor, say that that house is worth more now than it was a year ago when it was, when it was flooded? And so there's some things that need to be looked at. And I, I don't think anybody's arguing that. It's just who's going to look at them, how hard are they going to look at them, and how are we going to resolve that issue? Because we can all say we can identify the problem. It's how we're going to fix the problem. And, and those are some of the things that need to be fixed as well. I will be, as I said before, I'll be here this afternoon uh, also helping out. So if anybody has any questions, I will be available for them too. Thank you again, everybody, for having us today. Thank you, Dan. So, I'm not sure if Hillary is feeling disappointed. She hasn't got to ding anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the last but definitely stop present from the office is, is Sharon. Thank you. Oh my gosh, you guys, thank you so much for letting me join you today. Um, and almost every place I've lived, I've always tried to do a habitat project or some sort of um, land test project because I love working with power tools, but I'm not actually handy. Uh, so I did one actually, the most exotic one, I think I told a few of you, I did one in Botswana. I took a group of high school students on a study abroad trip, and it was, we did a cement foundation, and then a cinder blocks and a tin roof. Um, and if you saw someone living in a house like that in America, you'd be horrified. Um, and you'd be like, well, where's your insulation? Where's your electricity? Everyone was using gas and propane. Um, but it was a home. And I think we need more, maybe not um, no insulation and all cinder block and tin roofs, but we need more types of homes. I think that's one of the biggest problems that we're facing right now is, you know, years ago we decided that everyone needed half an acre in a single family home. And we haven't updated that for the fact that lives are changing, families look different. I think they always look different, we just didn't acknowledge it. Um, and that young people are having a really hard time getting a start right now. So, um, I live in the Leonard Streets. We bought a few years ago right at the right time for about $300,000, and it's more than double that now. I joke with my husband that we should have just not worked. We should have just bought two. Um, it would have made just as much money. Um, so I have you know, two, three jobs, whatever you want to call this politics job. Um, the price of land probably isn't going down. Um, but what we can do is we can use our land more efficiently we can allow people to build duplexes and more neighborhoods and triplexes. And I will tell you in the Leonard Streets, I can walk to, I counted the number of breweries the other day, it was about 15. Um, <laughs> and this is a two beers a month girl. <laughs> um, a few of them even with toddlers that we can walk to. And one of the reasons that you're able to do that is because I have so many wonderful neighbors and so many different types of homes. So it's zone single family. My home would not be legal to build today because of the setbacks on, we live right off of Cornwall, um, and so we're trying to add an addition and we have to put some funny angles in because of these setbacks that do not, I think, contribute to the value of our neighborhood. Our neighborhood is lovely. People come in from Ferndale to walk around it and look at the gardens and the dahlias. And, um, I knew it was the right place when I saw the stop sign was yarn bombed. I was like, these are the people. Um, <laughs> and so what we can do in the Leonard Streets is we can allow people to build six buses and build things like what we were working on today, although what I helped out was digging a hole for the little library. Um, <laughs> so lots more little libraries. Um, and we can allow people to build garden cottages. And I think that's the way that we've got to go forward. And I will tell you, I think the city process is maybe a little broken. The city council members hear from the people who are worried about a duplex moving in next door but they don't hear from all the young people that are struggling to find housing. And we have to make it easier to build more and especially build in cities. 
I'm, uh, we have to build out and build up a little bit. I think especially building up, that's where the jobs are. That's where people want to live. It's where the infrastructure already exists. It's also where it's an environmental solution as well. And so we have to wrap all these things together and figure out how to do this. Last session, I had a bill that was the first bill of its kind that made it through the house. We know we need to do this work. I teach urban economics at Western, and when I teach, I don't put politics into the office. Um, but all my students want to see this movement forward. They are energized by this. Um, and they are really upset that our generation has not done this work yet, um, because they want to be part of these communities. So um, where is I going with this? I think I was going to say um, that the, the students are super housing focused. And I would love to see more four plexes in the lettered streets, more six plexes in the lettered streets. It's right next to downtown, and you can walk almost everywhere. And I always thought that that has added to my community. I live across the street from a 16-plex apartment complex. It's low income, and they are absolutely lovely neighbors. We, on um, Christmas Day, after you open up all the presents with the kids, um, my family lives kind of far away, so we go out and we, I share cookies with people on the streets. And, and we talk to each other, and we wish each other a Merry Christmas and have a lovely day, and I'm so, much richer because of my amazing neighbors that live near me in that community. Um, what were the other questions? It was, so housing affordability, access to capital, um, policy priorities. So I, I, um, I am kind of an accidental politician. I never thought I'd run for office, just nobody else was going to do it, and I believe democracy is about choices. One of the reasons I decided to run for state senate is I felt like we needed to fix our broken housing market. And a big part of that is looking at the zoning, looking at the regulations, looking at ways of how can the government get out of the way of allowing these private market solutions, still protect all the things that we care about. I still don't want people building in the floodway. I still want to make sure that we have viable agriculture in Whatcom County and we have enough land and farm production. I still worry about people moving out to the forest where they're much more at higher risk for wildfire. Right? We have to think about this as an equilibrium. And I think there is a state reason to do that, and that's because when Seattle doesn't build enough, it's generating a lot of jobs, a lot of people want to work there, then what they do is they export their housing problems to the next city, and to the next city and the next city. And I think Bellingham's state failure to build enough housing, which started about 10 years ago, has resulted in higher prices in Ferndale. It's resulted in people moving out to the floodplains. I have friends that were flooded out, and I didn't even know they lived in Everson, uh, because they spent so much of their time driving back and forth and, their community is in, Walk, in Bellingham. Um, so there is a reason to do this at the state level. Um, one of the things that I'd also like to see is, I'd like to make building homes and being kind of a mini developer more accessible to more people. So one of the ideas I had was, could we create a program once we legalize ADUs everywhere, um, where the, if you want to borrow money to build an ADU, it's really difficult because um, the assessor will tell you, the appraisers tell you it's not going to add enough value. So unless you already have that equity, you don't have that access to capital. Well, the state could guarantee some of these loans. I've been working with the Housing Finance Commission to look into, could we get the state to guarantee these loans? Um, then Miku or someone else could administer those loans. And if we're using state resources, there has to be a state purpose. So the idea would be, we'll help you loan the money to get access to this capital to build it you use in your backyard. But the deal is during the term of that mortgage, you would have to rent it out to someone who's otherwise income eligible, right? So I think of this as a decentralized housing project where we get a whole bunch of units built around Whatcom County and make it really easy for regular people to be part of this solution. Um, we're still working on pieces that it's kind of a pie in the sky, but I have been talking to city council members about making ADUs easier to build by having a pre-approved plan so that maybe we could build it with a modular home company in Ferndale. So all you have to do is say, yeah, I want to do this. If we have some people that come in, they know the permitting, they know how it works, and we're able to pop them in and get some housing built. Was that my nine minutes? One minute. One minute. Awesome. Um, what else do I need to talk about? Access to capital. I love talking about access to capital. That is huge. Um, what resources? Um, one of the things that I'd like to do is we spend, we put about $400 million into affordable housing, which is a huge commitment. That's enormous. Um, but you look at the size and you look at the problem. So we're missing about 150, 270,000 homes statewide is what the need is, which is a lot. Um, if you look at what it costs to build something like Eleanor Place, I just, I counted out the amount of money that they got to build it and then divided by the number of units. About three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a unit. If we build it all the affordable housing just in affordable housing that way, we're not going to get there. And 
unless we're willing to see really big tax increases, which I don't think we're willing to. It's gotta take private market solutions. And so innovating, making sure that we're able to remove as many barriers as we can while still protecting the things that are important to us, that's what I wanna spend the next four years figuring out. Regulation by regulation, how do we get more homes built? And I want you all to be my partners in this. So thank you. Yesterday, um, Chris and I went out to uh, um, some property just uh, just off Northwest Avenue, and uh, and we went up there initially to uh, take a look at at three homes that um, a habitat supporter might have available to help temporarily house some of the Ukrainian refugees that come from America. So this is typically not what we do, but. But we have a lot of tentacles out there, and we reached out, and, and so this is wonderful. If someone wants to help to 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 better help these folks get established here in the field. Uh, but that conversation went went a lot deeper, and, and I'm going to go there next. But before I go there next, I wanted to paint a picture. So um, this time of year, in a state that I lived 20 years in, in, in Vermont, um, so uh, eastern Vermont and, and western New Hampshire, the Connecticut River Valley. Um, this is the time of year where you would not be able to get a hotel room because the foliage there is that we got dead. Gorgeous. Uh, and uh, but if you've ever been to New England this time of year and, and, um, and the locals are actually called the leaf peepers, um, that uh, when you've driven through all the towns, you'll, you'll notice that well, it seems like all the towns kind of on a regular beat here. And, and typically they're about seven miles apart on both sides of the Connecticut River Valley. And so, so how did it end up being that way? I guess where I'm going now is kind of how maybe you envision land use and density, because we're talking about, about both here. Um, so uh, I used to work for, for an organization called Old Fort Number 4. It was um, a job that I had in my, in my late 20s. And it was fun because I got to dress up in in costume, a pre a pre it was a, a pre-revolutionary war British fort. So it was in uh, what was known as Charlestown, New Hampshire. At that time, it was called Fort Number Four, and it was the um, the extent of British influence on the North American continent in the 1740s and the 1750s. And um, and this fort was at the cross section of two major trading routes. And of course, the the uh, this was. The, French Indian War was probably the first world war, but this was where kind of all the action was happening. So how, how um, Fort Royal or Charlestown area got started is that it came from a King's Grant. And, um, and so you could buy or, or be granted this grant, and then you were required to create 100 shares. And so um, for this massive territory, you would get a, a village lot, you would get a pasture lot and you would get a wood lot. And, um, and the, the housing lot was very concentrated and it was concentrated at that time mainly because of, of safety reasons is that you wanted to be able to defend the village. And so at Fort Number 4, where it became Charlestown, they built this huge picket fence around it and that's how they defended the, the area. But, but because of that kind of original land plan is, is how is that you created these cute little villages with pasture land, open spaces where you could see the trees. And so it is, it's just dropped it gorgeous. So try to keep that in your mind. What we have to need to add to the mix today is that, is that we also need to take care of our weapons. Um, that was not something that people worried about um, at that time. Um, so, so yesterday, um, these three homes, um, they were on a 48 lot. And so, um, within this 48 lot, lot, there were up to five development rights. And what could go on each of those lots that could be developed out of these 40 acres would what Habitat would call a McMansion, a 4,000 square foot home, right? And it would create sprawl. And so if you can envision, if you say, well, gee, it makes sense that if you want to preserve wood, woodlands, if you want to preserve farmland or pasture land, that that one home for five acres maybe makes sense, right? But it doesn't have to be in five acres, right? 
So how can you how can you envision so you kind of create the density that you want, create those cute little villages where people come together and interact, but preserve the wetlands and the patch of land and the woodlands that we all value so much that makes it keep that little picture. So, so that's one of the things I wanted is you're thinking about, you know, please it's called it's called the hundred system. And so if you kind of want to look it up, but it goes back hundreds hundreds of years. Um, uh, yeah. So the other thing that comes up is, is, is the um, is the access to um, to low cost capital, and um, I want everyone to know is that um, the only reason why the Telegraph Road project has survived is because of uh, the partnership that we have with the Community Foundation here. That um, they have provided um, basically this points a 1.6 million dollar line of credit. Um, and so, uh, not in the traditional way. So a, a foundation has um, money that gives away, and we ask them all the time for money. But they also have money that they're required to invest so that they have money to give away. And so what um, uh, Habitat and Culture, the partnership have been able to do, is to tap into that part that they are required to invest. And so, um, so they've got stocks and bonds and, and other investments. And what, they, what the Community Foundation agreed to do was to um, basically freeze those assets and place those assets as a loan, as collateral for this. And so um, when you have uh, something that's liquid as a stock of one in cash, that um, the interest rate that a bank is willing to would charge comes down because they, if they have to collect on the collateral, um, it's so much easier, it doesn't cost them so much. Um, we also have a wonderful partner in, in Wiku Bank. And um, so Wiku Bank said that yes, not only are we glad we'll work with the Community Foundation on that, but Wiku is offering this project um, money at the cost of funds. So we're so, so this is a great private solution which um, which Habitat loves when we can find solutions in the marketplace. And that's kind of what I heard too, is that we just gotta be creative about how we free these resources up. So I just want to bring those two things up. I want to thank all of you for coming out today and, and helping. Um, really enjoyed all your comments and yeah, the, the round of applause for everyone. <laughs>